A Kusumbo Dam, an investment in or an exploitation of a developing country. Introduction. Construction of a Kusumbo hydroelectric dam started in 1961 in the Republic of Ghana. Upon completion in 1965, the dam formed Lake Volta, the largest man-made body of water on Earth, covering 3.6% of Ghana's land mass. The dam has many pros and cons. While some argue the economic benefits to Ghana are indispensable, others claim the damage done to the communities in and around the flooded areas is inexcusable and that foreign investors took advantage of Ghana's instability in order to secure cheap electricity for their ventures. In this essay, I will be looking at the benefits and consequences of the dam, social, environmental, political, and economic. A brief history of Ghana, pre-1961. From 1471 to 1867, many European countries claimed parts of what we now know as Ghana in order to exploit its abundant natural resources. In 1867, the British Gold Coast was established, and over the next few decades, the surrounding kingdoms and colonies were incorporated into the British Gold Coast, which continued to exploit the natural resources of the country for the benefit of the United Kingdom. In the wake of the Second World War, the population of the British Gold Coast began pressing for more autonomy from the UK, resulting in the formation of Ghana as a Commonwealth realm in 1957, and Pan-Africanist revolutionary Kwame Nkrumah as the first Prime Minister. Then, in a referendum in 1960, 88.5% of Ghana's population voted to become a republic, forming the Republic of Ghana on July 1st, 1960, still under the rule of Kwame Nkrumah. Political and economic factors. Seeing a hydroelectric dam as a means to propel Ghana into prosperity, Nkrumah adopted the Akusambo Dam project in the late 1950s. The full plan involved not only the construction of the dam, but the construction of an electric smelter in Tema to refine Ghana's bauxite deposits into aluminium using the electricity created by the dam. To raise the necessary funds, around £230 million, Nkrumah consulted with the US President Eisenhower in March 1958, who advised him to seek investment from private American companies. From there, Nkrumah met with Edgar Kaiser of Kaiser Aluminium, who agreed to build the aluminium smelter upon negotiating an incredibly low price for electricity from a Kusumbo Dam, and to pay no tax on imports or exports. Now all that was left for Nkrumah was to secure the funds necessary for the dam itself, roughly half the total sum. This came in the form of loans from World Bank, a loan from the UK government, and the remainder in US foreign aid. Late in negotiation, however, Kaiser made it clear that they would not be using Ghana's bauxite supply, as Nkrumah had assumed, and would be importing bauxite for smelting, depriving Ghanaians of jobs in the mining industry and Ghana's government from that industry's taxation. This was claimed to be due to the low quality of the ore. However, Kaiser later admitted to another reason. They feared, if they were entirely reliant on Ghana, the aluminium industry would one day be nationalised. Furthermore, in the midst of the Cold War, the US began using their investment as a means to negate Nkrumah's socialist ideals. Going so far, Nkrumah spoke on the matter at the UN in 1960. It's quite clear that a desperate attempt is being made to create confusion in the Congo, extend the Cold War to Africa, and involve Africa in the suicidal powers of foreign powers. The United Nations must not allow this to happen. Despite all this, Nkrumah knew there was only one way this project was going to happen, and construction started in 1961. Once operational, the dam supplied power to Kaiser's aluminium smelter, as well as providing 70% of domestic electricity, which at the time was less than 20% of the dam's capacity. In the wake of Akusambo Dam's economic success, rapid industrialization took place in Ghana. However, due to the collapse of coca prices in 1965 and the subsequent lack of foreign exchange, Ghana was plunged into economic turmoil. This, along with Nkrumah's decision to declare Ghana a one-party state and appoint himself lifetime president, lost Nkrumah much of his credibility and many of his supporters. Eventually, Nkrumah fell. On February 24, 1966, while Nkrumah was in Beijing, the military seized power. As demand for electricity within Ghana soared, going from around 540 gigawatt hours to 1,300 gigawatt hours per year between 1967 and 76, resentment for Valco built, as they continued to pay little for the electricity they used. In 1983, Jerry Rawlings, president by military coup, assembled a team with the aim of extracting more money from Valco. I must share this fact with you, that Ghana has no money. We cannot build a bridge, or make a road, or give our people water or medicines without borrowing from other countries. Rawlings' team eventually fired for the long-feared nationalisation of the aluminium smelter. 
Due to impeccable timing were the drought that allowed Volta River Authority to halt the electricity supply to Valco until they thought it safe, Valco were forced to increase their prices or stop production. Today, 70% of Ghana's population have access to electricity, as opposed to 3% before the construction of a Kutumbo Dam, with an estimated 50% of households in rural communities having access to electricity. Ghana's economy is also twice the average of the West African subregion, and consistently invites industry due to low-cost hydroelectric power. Moreover, in years of drought, when hydroelectric generation has been at its lowest, unemployment rates have risen drastically, attesting to a Kusumbo Dam's positive impact on Ghana's economy. Human Welfare The first major issue was the relocation of some 80,000 inhabitants of the Volta River Basin, just over 1% of Ghana's population at the time. The inhabitants were given two options, to be paid compensation and relocate themselves, or to be relocated by the government, and over 90% of people chose the latter. The resettlement of people from 740 small villages to 52 larger ones proved disastrous, causing issues in communication between the eight different ethnic groups resettled, each of whom had their own dialect and unique cultural practices. In addition to this, of those who were promised compensation for loss of property, 69% of people surveyed in 2006 said they had not received any. The influx of male workers during the construction of the dam, coupled with the collapse of rural economies and the instability of the nation's economy, resulted in an increase in women finding work in prostitution, and in turn, HIV became a prominent issue in the districts west and south of Akusumbo Dam, with an infection rate four times that of the nation's average. Lake Volta itself also contributed to many health issues. Due to an increase in population of waterborne vectors like mosquitoes, there has been a 10% rise in malaria cases, and a notable increase in many other diseases. On the other hand, the second dam built in the Volta River Basin, Kapong Dam, created a reservoir that encapsulated much of the fast-flowing water in the area, thus destroying the breeding grounds for black fly and curtailing the spread of river blindness. Several factors have resulted in lower crop yields and in turn higher rates of malnourishment in communities reliant on local produce. These factors include the acute control of water level within Lake Volta for the safety of the dam, stopping periodic flooding of the agricultural land in the Volta River Basin, thus interrupting the natural deposition of sediment that previously fertilised the land, and a failure in communication between farmers and the appropriate authorities leaving the dam's capacity for irrigation largely unutilised. Environment At the time of the dam's construction, long-term environmental consequences were not given serious consideration in any of the reports by Kaiser or by Imprigila the firm responsible for the construction of the dam, as economic factors were given overwhelming priority. However, some of these issues have already proved to be financially detrimental. The hastened erosion of nearby coastlines due to the lack of sediment making its way to the mouth of the Volta River has forced the implementation of a project to fortify the coast of Togo, costing 2.8 million for each kilometre protected. Sandbars at the mouth of the Volta River have also become a problem. Before the construction of the dam, seasonal floods cleared the estuary of sandbars, but today the Volta River Authority regularly dredged the channel to ensure sandbars do not inhibit the natural flow of the river, an additional unforeseen expense. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, research done in association with international rivers has shown the formation of large reservoirs can produce high levels of methane and carbon dioxide due to the decomposition of organic matter within the reservoir. This is an issue particularly prevalent in tropical regions due to the faster decomposition of organic matters, and with dams in a reservoir shallow in proportion to its surface area, as the amount of electricity generated is proportional to the capacity of the reservoir, and the large surface area of the lake allows for faster diffusion of greenhouse gases, resulting in higher emissions per unit of electricity generated. A Kusumbo Dam falls victim to both these issues. Today, the negative impacts of a Kusumbo Dam are actively minimised, the Volta River Authority have several programs in place to use a proportion of their profits for the benefit of the people affected by the project, including afforestation programs, an annual commitment of £400,000 to the Resettlement Trust Fund to support development initiatives in the resettlement towns, and free specialist and general medical care to communities along Lake Volta accessible only by boat. However, there are plans for the construction of more hydroelectric dams in the Volta River Basin, a somewhat regressive proposition undermining the very act of minimising damage already done. I'll leave you on one comment from my cousin, a civil engineer interested in protecting the environment. We need to rethink the way that we build dams. Instead of stopping a river and turning everything dry at the base of the river, we need to develop a new way to capture the energy from the running water while allowing for wildlife to move freely back and forth.